G'day guys, welcome back to another episode of Friday Knockoffs, brought to you by our friends at Pepper Jack. This week on the show, freshly retired star Jordan Roughhead. I'm going to talk to him about his time at the Doggies, winning a flag in 2016, heading over to the Pies. I'm going to debrief the rest of his career. He's waiting for me now. I'll catch you soon. <sighs> Ruffy. Phil, how are you, How are you mate? going, mate? Good to see you. What's happening? Not much. I mean, not much in heaps. Yeah, heaps. How's your week been? Been good, been different. Yeah. Um, used to having my life scheduled to within an inch of itself, but um, woke up on Monday, Tuesday this week and sort of was twiddling my thumbs a bit and just wondering what the day's held for me. So it's, um, it's been good. It's been good. Obviously retired from AFL footy, incredible career, premiership player. Uh, I don't want to be sitting with you today. How's it all feeling? How long was the decision? How, uh, how, how long were you thinking about it and, and how did it all come about? It shouldn't be an honour to be sitting there for starters. Um, <laughs> it definitely is. But, I mean, for me, like I've known for years now that um, my shoulder was likely to, to end my career. Mm. Um, it's been deteriorating for, for a long time and um, got to the point probably a year, 18 months ago, where I got to the point couldn't really do weights properly and... Um, knew that it was, it was winding up and I guess sort of six weeks ago I came back and played a game in Brisbane um, having had surgery in February and just didn't respond well, didn't get through the game well, didn't respond to it well and sort of started having conversations about what that might look like with the medicos and surgeons and stuff and I guess a month ago I sort of had almost in my mind decided that it was the right time to retire but just needed a, a confirmation from a surgeon to say the best, best thing for you is to retire to avoid a... Uh, a shoulder replacement in the immediate term, so um, I guess I've had a, a while to wrap my head around it, and it all sits really comfortably with me at the moment, which is a, a nice place to be, I think. Yeah. Well, what's actually the, the what was the problem with the shoulder? Like, was it just a, a continual dislocations or? Yeah. Like... Oh, I mean, I could trace it back all the way to high school. I reckon where yeah. I just had the, the first shoulder injury I've ever had. I remember smothering a ball in high school and just feeling a, a tear in the shoulder. And as a kid, you know what it's like. You're 15, 16, running around playing school footy. A couple of days later, you're fine and get on with it. Um, but then through the 2014 season, I, I reckon I dislocated it or subluxed it. Um, my right shoulder a dozen to 15 times throughout the year. and Should have listened to the advice and got it fixed at the start of the season, but wanted to, to see out the year. And um, it's now got osteoarthritis as a result. And um, yeah, unfortunately, they can't uh, generate the cartilage that I need back in there. So... And day to day, what's what's it like? Is it painful to, to live with? Like, um, good days and bad days. Mm. I mean, the night ache and, and night pain is the thing I struggle the most with. It keeps me up when I go to bed, and then wake up sort of two or three o'clock in the morning, um, and, and often don't get back to sleep. But that's something that I'm, I'm working through, and got a really good specialist who I, I go and see. And the the theory is that now that I'm no longer playing football. Uh, my shoulder will feel a lot better. Yeah, it's crazy. So fingers isn't it? crossed. Yeah, well, all the uh, you know, you put your head over it a lot more than I did, and there's a lot more physical battering. But you do get sore, my friend, and it, it does uh, it does sit with you for a while. But you're not uh, footy's not lost to you because you're staying around at the pies. What's the role going to be for, for the time being? Absolutely staying around. Um, so I'll still the, the great thing for me is that if I was to cut it off right now and go cold turkey, I'd it'd be pretty damaging for my mental health. I think. Um, so the good thing is I can still go in and get out there physically and, and run around with the guys and have a kick. Um, help out the guys that are coming back from rehab and do their running sessions and that sort of thing with them. Um, but then it's just kind of just work through a few different departments, spend a little bit of time in coaching, a bit of time in recruiting. Um, I'm going to jump into the netball program next week just to see how another sport operates and I guess just find, try and find where my passion lies before the end of the season and end of the year and I have to actually go out there and start writing cover letters and write a CV for the first time in my life. Oh, mate, it's a scary time. Trust me, I've been there. And uh, Well, mate, if I can do it half as well as you have, I'll be pretty happy. No, well, I just had a lot of support, definitely. Uh, the, towards the end of my career, I started making better friends with the admin and business side of the building with any of the players. So I was spending right. most of my time upstairs hanging out with them because they actually have the brains. So then, then you uh, must the have become mates. one of the, the different cats, that no. we like to call them. Yeah, you. yeah, exactly. No, you quickly realise who can, uh, can help you, um, uh, you know, transition best, but it looks like you're doing that extremely well. Back to your career. Grew up being a dog supporter, yep. playing for the dogs. What was it like? There's a good uh, motto going around, don't be heroes. Was it the same for you when you got drafted there or were you happy to be there? Uh, no, I was stoked to be there, to be honest, mate. It's, um, I mean, yeah, grew up as a Bulldog supporter, got there, was playing with guys like Brad Johnson, Daniel Giannis, Rob Murphy, who I'd idolised as a kid. Did you play with Nathan Eagleton? 
I did play with. He was actually my, my mentor. When That's I first got um, he's club. like my nostalgic play. Whenever I think of growing up, I think we're talking before off air about like smells and sounds. Yep. Whenever I think of him, I just think of like coming home, sitting on the couch, watching Nathan Eagleton. He, he was a ripper too. Yeah. So he, yeah, he was my mentor when I first got <laughs> to the club. And I remember him taking me out for dinner and showing me the, the sights, Ballarat boy. So I knew Melbourne well enough, but he was just taking me around, giving me the tour and sure enough, took me to the casino had a good feed, <laughs> won a little bit on rule out. So it was your classic like late 2000s yeah. introduction to, to Melbourne and to footy, but um, great guy, Eggs, still um, still involved in footy over in SA, I think. And um, Yeah, so anyway, loved loved the dogs, loved my time there. Um, and, and it was, it was a, a great organisation with, with great people in it. How long did it take you to, to break into the team? Like, what was it like? Because I know at that time as well, you had the good affiliation with Williamstown. Williamstown at the time? Yeah, which was one of the best. They've, like, they've got some incredible stories of that. Even with, um, I think they paid for Liam Pickin to they go did. on the dogs list and stuff. That, like that. Yeah, uh, so Liam was my draft. and he, yeah. So he was at the end of 2008 as well, rookie drafted. And, and yeah, I believe that Williamstown paid his, his entire contract in his first season just to get him the opportunity. Um, and he walked out of the game as a... 190 odd, mm. I think almost 200 game player, and was a superstar. Um, but my, like, it took me round five of my second year was my first AFL game. Um, but I spent the majority of my first year playing development league. So twos, in the twos, twos, twos in the twos, the twos. famous twos, twos. At the time, you could only play 12. I think it was 12 senior listed players in the affiliated seniors. So um, yeah, I'd be finished by lunchtime on a on a Saturday. Um, <laughs> straight down to, to Nando's and grab a burger and go back, watch the seniors, and then the seniors' seniors. So it was, yeah, 12 quarters of footy in a day most weekends, but loved it. Um, wouldn't change it for the world. How, far, like, how crazy is it now looking back? And I, I don't know what was going through your head at those stages, playing twos, twos. I know with numbers it's a little bit different, but did it seem that far away from you? Did you think that, you know, looking now, would you achieve what you achieved? Would you have gone, oh, my God, I'll take that any day? I think absolutely. Like, yeah. any, anyone who walks into, unless you're, like, a top three draft pick. Mm. I think most players would look at it and go 200 games in a, in a premiership. I'll take that. Um, and I, it did seem a long way away. Like I wasn't a massive footy head growing up. I was basketballer and followed NBA more than I, I followed the, the football. And so, and I've talked about this a few times th through the week with people that being drafted in 2008 was as much a result of being having a surname Roughhead and being six foot seven, which at the time Jared was really making his name in, in the league and, and doing great things and, and that certainly helped and um, went a long way to, to me being picked up. So I wasn't the most talented junior footballer, wasn't the most talented senior footballer, but just found a way to, to sort of work hard enough and, and get everything I could out of myself and, um, and, and found a way to contribute to something that was, was really special and, and great and means so much to so many people and, and I'm really grateful for, for the experience of that. Yeah, we'll get back to the, the 2016 Premiership in a second. But just on that point, then you said you you were sort of like coming through. You might not have felt like you deserved your, your place. Your words, I think. Um, what changed? Like, was there a, was there a pivotal moment? Was it like a conversation now with the coach? Was it an opportunity that you got where you're like, shit, this is actually me now. I can do this and I can do it really well. Not so much, mate. Like, I've I've always felt like a bit of an imposter in in really? football. Yeah. Like, I've never felt because I haven't been the most talented. I've never been the fittest, the strongest, the the best kick. It, I've always felt like. Like my, my place in my job was in doing the little things that no one else really wanted to do because that was my contribution to it. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you question there. Like I remember sitting at the end of the 2011 season, I'd been dropped to the, the VFL, playing with Williamstown, made the grand final, and I think had two touches in the, the 2011 VFL grand final and sat in my exit meeting a couple of days later and had a coach look me in the eye and sort of say, I don't think you're good enough to play AFL football and I think the only reason you've played AFL this year is because you're a good good bloke and people are rewarding you for that. And that was the moment that sort of my motivation for it changed mm. and it was then, well, I want to prove that coach wrong. I want to have a, a successful AFL career to prove that coach wrong. And it's sort of been, my motivation has changed across my, the 13 years that I've been doing it, but there's been a few times where it's been, I want to prove someone wrong and that's probably held me in greater stead than, than most other things. Love that. Absolutely love that. Well, things definitely did get proved wrong and, and you proved everyone, everyone wrong in that. Leadership, something that when I speak to you know, people you've played with and, and your friends and teammates, it's something that you're extremely well known for. You were part of the Dogs Leadership Group for a year or two um, as well. What was that like for you? What, did you? what did you love about being a part of it? Didn't love it, to be honest. Didn't love it? Um, no, like leading is something that, I don't reckon a heap of people go out and well, leadership is not, not a role that people go out and look for particularly. Um, 
it's it's something that, particularly in football, happens because you're a good player. Mm. Um, and I think if you look at lists and, and clubs across the, the the league, that the majority of captains, vice captains, leadership group players are the best players on the list, um, which doesn't necessarily equate to being the best leaders. Um, but it's it's how the industry sort of works and. Um, my experience of it, particularly initially, I hated it because I, I sort of thought, not that I thought, but I, I was put in positions where like, I had to um, discipline one of my teammates and, and tell them that they'd been suspended for sort of off-field misdemeanours and um, at the time felt that it was my job as a leadership group member to go and do that. If I was in the same situation now, I'd sit there and say, you're the jam of footy, it's your job to, to be telling them that, like, I don't want to damage the relationship ongoing with the, with a teammate. Um, so I had that challenge and um, felt like I was I was a police officer at the footy club and it was it was always about we're not doing things right, you need mm. to do that better or whatever it was. Um, but I've sort of realised more in my later years in football that authenticity is what leadership is. If you're an authentic person and, and you live your life the right way that people will will follow you or will um, will want to be in your presence and in your company and um, that's just kind of how I've tried to yeah, approach the, the back end and support as many people as I could through that period as well. Yeah, I love that. I think leadership has changed so much in, in footy in the last sort of 10, 10 years, especially from when I first got into what it is now. It seems like it's in such a good place. And exactly what you said, it's not about coming down on blocks, it's about being there for each other and it's not about being liked, it's about being respected. Mm. I wish I knew that a lot earlier in my career. Hey, Ruff, uh, Pepper Jack's all about character, mate, you've got that in spades. Um, I've got a question for you. What is a main characteristic you like to see in a leader and who are some examples that did it the best? I think I probably just just mentioned it there. Mm. The authenticity for me is, is the main thing. Um, I'll follow you regardless of what you believe. If you are honest and your values are sound, I'll follow you in, in whatever you tell me to do. Um, and I think the, f the one that I stepped into the club with Brad Johnson was, was captain of the Dogs when I walked in there. and he The way he played the game, everyone talks about the, the smiling assassin and he, he wore that grin throughout his career and that's just how he is as a person. Um, and even now, you bump into him every now and then at the, at the G or Marvel and he's still wearing the smile and still happy to see you and gives you a big hug. And he, he was um, an outstanding leader at the start. And, I mean, I've been really lucky. I've had great captains. Um, even Ryan Griffin, who who was the captain of the Bulldogs through through that tough period, he was um, he didn't want the the captaincy. He didn't even want to be in a leadership position. But he was he was a fantastic on field leader. Um, Pendles at, at the Pies has been incredible, um, and will continue to be. But the the one I've been talking to a few people about lately, we played the Blues on the weekend, and you might be able to tell me tell me this, if this is correct or not. But Sam Doherty just seems like an absolute, seems like one of the coolest blokes in Australia. Yeah. And I've played against him a few times and he's he's an angry little man out there. But I just, I, I look at him and I go, I'd love to sit and have a Friday Arvo knockoff and just get to know you. I'm picky yeah. a little bit. Yeah, oh, 100%. I actually get goosebumps when you say it because he's, yeah, we all know his story and what he's been through off the field, but it doesn't change who he is. And I think we talk about authenticity and probably what I mentioned earlier about when I was younger, I just wanted to be liked by everyone and you go in, you try and make friends and probably avoid those tough conversations. But Doc's one of my best mates to this day and I know if I need some honest feedback, I don't even actually have to ask for it. He just tells you. Like, and he doesn't tell you to be a leader. He tells you because he knows it's going to make you better. I bet he does it in a way that doesn't he, offend you either. He does it in... You know that it's just, like, he's just trying to make me better. He's mm. doing this to help me and he's mm. not just doing it to say, say something to be said. It's, it's honestly some of the best leadership that um that i've ever been a part of as well and he's actually not in the leadership this year just to step back and, and take care of himself but his role is exactly the same as it's always been oh and you watch him out he may not have the the title but you watch him and the way he goes about it and he he's leading that that footy club incredibly well he's a superstar he definitely is um i want to go back to the 2016 quickly because we talk about mason cox a mutual friend of ours who's obviously had uh, you know a lot of eye issues of late but you had a really you know serious eye injury yourself in 2016 just before the granny yeah, prelim. How, yep. how bad was that? Because it was, it was pretty serious. Uh, it could have been really serious. Yeah. Um, that's why I wear the, the goggles now. Um, yeah, prelim, second quarter of prelim, prelim I, I tried to smother a kick um, and must have just got the, literally the point of the football right in the eyeball. Um, and I had a high femur, which is where your eye bleeds behind the lens. So your, your eye literally fills up with blood. Um, so I got it. I was expecting it to be one of those ones you get hit in the eye and you couple of tears and go off the ground two minutes later you're good to go but the doc sort of looked at me and they went no nah, you're not going back out there 
because I was blind in that, that eye, in my right eye. So just you had no vision in that eye? Just grey. Yep. Just everything was grey. How long did that last for? By the time we got back to Melbourne on the flight, I had like I could see shapes, couldn't see much. Um, and basically, yeah, I was in a... I mean, I don't, this has been talked about before. I was in a dark room for a few days. Um, gradually, my vision came back. Went to the, the eye specialist every day of the week just to push my case and say that I was, I was going to be right for, it, for the granny. Um, and sort of, even grand final day, like, you know, you've been at a, a nightclub or whatever and the smoke machine went off like five minutes ago. Never been to a no. nightclub, obviously. <laughs> the smoke machine's gone off five minutes ago and there's still just that haze in the room. Like, yes. Yeah, that's, that was my grand final experience. That's super scary, like, to, to, mm. to go into the biggest game of your life not knowing if you're, one, going to get up and two, if you can ever even see the footy. Well, it's huge while the club, because it's sort of like a, I don't know what the number was, say a one in four chance that yeah. I'd have another bleed, which would then, again, result in the, the same thing, and I'd be ruled out in the first five minutes of the game. But fortunately, yeah, got through and um, was able to yeah, really enjoy the experience and day I'll look back on very fondly for forever. Still, um, you know, one of the best grand finals I've seen. I was actually at the game. It was unbelievable. And I just remember, obviously, that, you know, that period, everyone sort of riding the dogs and the momentum was there. Talk us through the actual game itself. We spoke about the lead-up before. What do you remember about the game um, in its entirety? And was there, like, a pivotal moment? I'm a footy lover. I love that time in a grand final that can swing a game. There were so many in this that it's hard to count. Like, what was that little niche that you just love and look back on? It's funny, mate, because I haven't watched the game back. What? I, I've, I, I hate seen, when like, people... It's, it's if I won a grand final, I would watch it. I'd wake up to it playing every morning. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've seen the, I've seen some of the highlights of the game and, and that sort of thing, but I've never sat down and watched it from first bounce to to the final siren. Um, it's, it, it's a bit of a blur. Um, not because of the eye, just in not, general? Well, both. OK. Um... I mean, pivotal moments like the Dale Morris tackle, yep. obviously, um, Liam picking yep. which one of his goals do you want to pick. Shane um, Biggs never forget. Shane Biggs never forget. Which is the, like, 15 pressure acts on the Tom on the Boyd's wing. game was just Unbelievable. stupid good. Um, justified the, the huge contract. And, yep. and Tom, I'm good mates with Tom, and he, he um, he's an absolute ripper of a fella, and I'm stoked that he had such a, a dominant performance on the day. Um, but, I mean, the, the thing that... I've always appreciated in football, like, you can go out and have 35 touches and kick three goals because you're a freak talent. But, like, someone like Fletcher Robert who yeah. gets a job on, between him and Joel Hamling, get a job on Buddy Franklin and Kurt Tippett, you go into that game and you go, well, one of them's probably going to kick five or six. But the job they did on the day was, was really special um, and, and probably doesn't get talked about enough. Mm. So, yeah, I, it is, it's, a day, it, it's, it's weird. I've got a bit of a... Tingle down the spine there. Maybe I go home. I've got heaps of time now, so I'll go home and watch it. Now, now I reckon maybe. we get a bowl of pepper jack, you and I. We'll go back and sure. watch it. I'll Sounds talk good. You it. Sounds good. Um, two years later, end up at the Pies. How did that sort of come about? What was the, the story there? Oh, just my naivety a little bit, I think, mate. Yeah. Um, no, I felt like at the time I was a bit in the doghouse and probably should have been playing senior footy, but was sort of in and out on the fringe. Um, and in hindsight, look back and go, well, I was a, an undersized ruck that didn't win hit outs and didn't get much of the footy. And the Bulldogs had drafted Tim English, end of 16, I reckon. So he was starting to sort of establish himself and was going to be their, their future ruckman. So I probably should have seen that my role, particularly in the ruck, was, was gone or was, was on the way out, um, but didn't feel that way and, and sort of thought, it, thought that I still had more to, to give to a, an AFL team and um, basically just wanted an opportunity to do that. Uh, and... Wouldn't have scripted it like this, but I, I thought I was going to Perth to, to play for West Coast, and yeah. that sort of fell through at the last minute. Um, Bridge, my fiance at the time, and I were going to America a few days later, and I was like, well, either someone picks me up or I'm done. Like, that's it. And to be honest, I'm, I'm ready to move on, which I thought I was at the time. Now I know that I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, fortunately, the Pies came knocking last minute. Literally went, had a meeting with, with Justin Longmuir, who was the backs coach at the Pies at the time and jumped on the plane the next day. Um, yeah, came back a Collingwood player and I couldn't have scripted it better. My experience there has been absolutely phenomenal. I've loved it from, from day one to the final day and, um, yeah, it's, it's been great. Unreal. And what was, if you can go into detail around the, on the West Coast trade, like what happened there? Like was it nearly done? Like who was, who was the trade it was, looking like? Yeah, I mean, it's that, I mean, it's that, closing that business, stories. isn't it? Like, yeah. um, I was, so I went over, met with the, the coach and the list manager and whatever and I, th I honestly thought it was a done deal. Um, they were looking for a backup to, to Nick Nat, who was sort of coming back from his knees and only was playing sort of 50% game time. And 
I thought that was going to be me the next year. And then Tom Hickey sort of bobbed up yes. late um, and he ended up signing there before I did. Not that I know that the offer actually was ever coming through to me. But, yeah, he um, he signed it and he's another one. that's There's heaps of rucks out there that I'm just a, seems like a good dude and I'm so stoked for him that his experience at West Coast and now Sydney was, yeah, seems really positive. Uh, Friday night of the player, sure, you played in plenty, plenty of big games and, and absolutely dominated them. What was your routine? Um, Were you a routine guy? Were you uh, quite yeah, chill? I was a routine guy purely because I, I had pretty severe performance anxiety. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. For a lot of my, my career. It's kind of got worse as I got older, which is a Me bit too. weird. Yeah, right. Yeah, like yeah, bad. Okay. Really bad. I don't like, know what it is. It's well, like man, I was, you'd I was think that you'd like get sleeping better. pills the night before because I, wow. I would not sleep. I'd lie there thinking about getting a bag kicked on me. And, and that's part of being a fullback, I guess, is that you know that chances are tomorrow you're going to get goals kicked on you. Wow. And it's a matter of can I keep them to two or are they going to kick eight to ten, mm. which also happened a couple of times. But um, so, so I stuck to a routine because of that because it just gave me a, something to think about that wasn't then... Um, wasn't thinking about the game, wasn't thinking about the, the things that could, could go wrong. Um, so you'd often, and you probably wouldn't have known it, that, that I had that anxiety. Like, people would look at me before the game and go, like, geez, he's relaxed, he's chill, he's sitting on, leaning against the bump bag up against the wall. But it was absolutely a cover. Like, I was a duck on water. Calm on the surface, but underneath, just going a million miles an hour. Yeah. How, like, and, and how did you best combat it? Like, was there a way? Like, I know that, you know, performance anxiety stays with you for the whole game, there's other sort of strategies. Did you find any other ways that it, it worked to, to you know, lower the levels? Um, I learned like, I learned that it was okay to, to be beaten, mm. which was kind of a nice realization. Like again, it's it's something about playing as a key defender. You, you're playing against some of the best footballers in Australia, and you're playing on a Tom Hawkins one week, Tom Lynch the next week, Josh Kennedy the the following. So it's like. There are going to be times when you when you get beaten, and it's okay to get beaten. It's not you're not letting your team, your membership base, all the supporters down. Yeah. Um, and and that was that was growth for me. Was was sort of realising that, and that's what I try and like tell the younger key defenders coming through now is like you've got to have thick skin if you want to be a defender. You've got to have thick skin because you're never going to win awards. It's unlikely you're going to win awards. You're going to get goals kicked on you but you're not going to cost your team the game. And mm. it's funnily enough, I was, I was watching on Sunday, Carlton, Collingwood, game gets tight, siren goes, and someone asked me, they're like, geez, aren't, aren't you disappointed not to be out there? And I was like, absolutely not. No, no, not at all. The last 20 minutes of that game, my <laughs> heart rate's 200. Yeah. Because I'm going, the only player that can win them the game is a bloke I'm standing next to. Whether we're one goal up or six goals up, mate, it's it's. I, I love your honesty and I really applaud your vulnerability because it's it's gonna it actually will help a lot of players and this is why you will play such a good role at Collingwood and, and whatever you do in footy, because the performance anxiety stuff like I feel like it just doesn't you know we, we we're very good with our mental health and what we're doing outside the game but for some reason performance anxiety just doesn't really get touched on with players and no one really wants to talk about it. I think it's getting it is getting there. Okay. It's it's a, it's again it's a changing landscape and you talked about leadership in footy clubs before and how far it's come in the last decade. And, and I think that the, the mental side of the game is, is coming mm -hmm. leaps and bounds, more so in the last sort of three or four years. Um, we've, at the Pies, we've got a performance psychologist now who we do sort of review and preview stuff with. Um, and, and she spends a lot of time working one-on-one -on -one with the players as well. So it is a space that's changing, but you're right. I wish I'd known 2009, my first season, that I needed to invest heavily in, in that side of the game because I was gonna have challenges and, and it was gonna, yeah, I was going to have some sleepless nights thinking about mm. or feeling like I'd, I'd let everyone down. Huge. What's the new plan for tonight, mate? Watch uh, sitting back, Friday night footy, what are you going to do? <sighs> tonight I've got a mate's 30th, so okay. it's nice. I'm, usually I wouldn't be able to go to a Friday night 30th and, and have a couple of beers, but tonight's uh, the first of hopefully a few to come. Fantastic. Well, I've got you to take you something, actually. We'll put all the pepper jack to take that 30th yeah, to uh, make sure you're the, the most popular man there. You yeah, beauty. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. I appreciate that, mate. Great to catch up. No, thank you. Congratulations on an incredible career as well, mate. I can't Thanks wait to uh, see what you're up to next. Cheers, mate. Thank you.